great to see you here and glad everyone made it safely this morning and um, just good to be together. So uh, let me invite you to stand. We're going to, I know people are still coming in from Sunday school and that's great too. We're going to go ahead and begin worship this morning. We're going to stand on his promises. Amen. Let's sing this together.
Lord, we love you so much, God. And Father, just as we sing, Father, we we need you, Lord. And Father, we just thank you, God, for being with us, Lord. We are uh, so joyful to be able to say that, God, you never leave us nor forsake us, God. And just thank you, Father, for being here. We welcome you here this morning, Father, for our time of praise and worship. And, and God, uh, studying your word. And Father, we just pray, God, that you'll just move amongst your people here this morning as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, may be seated. So glad you guys are all here this morning. Hope y'all had a great week. Happy Valentine's Day. Hope y'all had a good morning so far. Uh, Chapel family, I want to pleasure to see you morning, you guys. Visitors and friends, if this is the first time you've been to Chapel Hill, we'd like especially welcome to you. We've got some information on our screens. If you don't mind, we'd love to record your visit with us by texting your first and last name to our phone number here at the church. And also, on the back of the chairs, there's a card you can fill out and, and drop off at the welcome desk. Again, if this is the first time you've been here, and receive a free gift for coming today. We'll have some uh, greeters at that desk as, as we uh, end our services today, so we'll just drop that off. Chapel, please make our visitors feel welcome this morning. Don't mind. <laughs> just a couple of announcements. Uh, if you didn't pick up an after seat, please do so before you leave. A lot of information on here, dates and times. We're, we'll be having a quarterly business meeting on Sunday, February 28th. We'll do that right after uh, the morning worship service. And also, prime time, if you didn't sign up for Eagle Trail, please do so before you leave. I've got that at the, at the welcome desk as well. And at this time, we'll have a scripture reading by Miss Barbara Johnson. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sin sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. We can applaud the word, amen. Let me invite you to stand. That's the uh, the truth, the power, and the testimony of this song. Our sins, they are many, uh, but his mercy is more.
church is. The church is a servant to others. We think about ministering to other people. We think about sharing the gospel with people. We think about preaching the gospel. We think about taking the gospel uh, across the street and around the world. We think about serving others. We think about ministering to others. We think about doing for others. 
God's called us to that. We are an others-minded people. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. But sometimes I think that in the midst of all of our focus on others, sometimes we can forget not what we should do for others, but what God has done for us. And this morning, as we continue walking through 1 Timothy, I want you to go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 12. We're going to be looking at some of the things that God has done for us. Do you realize that God has given the church gifts? There are three gifts that are mentioned here in the passage that we're going to look at this morning. There's the gift of mercy. There's the gift of the gospel. And there's the gift of a charge. If you've noticed, uh, there is a theme already that's been running throughout the service. It's the theme of mercy. Uh, Barbara read the scripture where we saw in Ephesians 2 that God is the God of mercy. We sang that great song by Matt Papa that our sins, there are many, but you can take all of our sins and add them up. And guess what? His mercy is more. It's always more. And so, but I want us to look this morning, and I want us to think specifically about the gifts that God has given to us, his mercy, his gospel, and the charge. First Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, and I'm going to ask you to stand as we read the first part of this passage. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength. Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent op opponent. But I received what? Mercy. There it is. I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed to me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And he's going to say it a second time, but I received what? Mercy. But I received mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. This is the word of God. God has given us, followers of Christ, God has given us mercy. In spite of what we deserve, that's what mercy is, God has given us mercy. Now, let's remember who wrote this. Timothy is the one who's receiving this letter, but it's being written by someone who was very close to Timothy, a good friend of his, a mentor of his, Paul. And Paul, who's writing this letter to Timothy, and he's writing to tell him, stay focused on the truth, proclaim the truth, organize the church. Paul did not always think this way. Paul was not always a churchman. Paul was not always concerned about the things of the gospel. He was once a blasphemer, he says. He was once a persecutor. He was once an insolent opponent. That means violent. Not only did he oppose philosophically the things of Christ, he opposed violently the people of Christ. Paul sought to stamp out Christianity. Before Paul came to know the Lord, you know, his name was Saul. He lived a very different life. His life was opposed to the things of Christ. And yet, hold your place and turn over to Acts chapter 9. Paul had a Damascus Road experience. Now, what a coincidence. He was on the Damascus Road, and he had this, what we call, a Damascus Road experience. It says in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, 
But Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he was rounding up Christians. He was killing Christians. He was seeking to imprison them and do away with them. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said, Rise and go to the street called Straight and the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a, in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, said to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. All of us in this room, if we know the Lord, we were souls. Every single one of us has been shown mercy. I don't deserve to be standing here. You don't deserve to be sitting there. We don't deserve when we die to meet the Lord face to face, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. But guess what? He has shown mercy to us. I want you to see a quick video about the mercy shown to Paul. The miracle of mercy. Paul. This is Saul. Saul was a Pharisee who hated the followers of Jesus so much that he would hunt them down to be brought to trial in Jerusalem. And he would even seek to murder them. uttering threats with every breath, and he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He asked him to write a letter to the Jews in Damascus that would allow him to arrest any Christians he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Now Saul went on his way. And as he came near Damascus, a light from heaven flashed around him, and he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul cried out, Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus. Rise and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. So Saul got up, and he opened his eyes, but he couldn't see anything. So the men who were with Saul led him into the city. After three days, a man named Ananias came to Saul. He put his hands on Saul and immediately Saul could see again. And with that, Saul became a follower of Jesus. 
He became the very thing he had tried to hunt, and he immediately began telling people that Jesus is the Son of God, and he taught them about the mercy of God that he had received, and all who heard him were amazed. He then went by a new name, Paul, as he began preaching not just to the Jewish people, but to everyone. Despite many difficulties like being imprisoned, shipwrecked, and narrowly escaping death multiple times, Paul continued to preach about Jesus. Paul said that he would do everything he could to save people and help them know God. And that's just what he did in order to reach people who would otherwise be unreached. And many came to know Jesus because of what Paul said. Paul taught many in his day through his letters, but even more have come to learn more about Jesus through the letters of Paul that can be read even to this day. Don't you love watching cartoons? <laughs> ah, I do. My favorite part of that cartoon is when Saul, he's blind on the Damascus Road and he stands up and he goes, he can't see. And then when a knight, Ananias comes into his room and he gives him his sight back, Paul goes, <laughs> like that. Uh, but that, more than just this happens when Jesus gets hold of him. So what is mercy? Mercy is not receiving what you should have received, right? That's mercy. Mercy is when I don't get what I should have gotten. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I've not gotten what I was supposed to, should have gotten. There's a lot of talk today about justice. I'm glad that I've not received justice. Because justice has been poured out on Christ. And because justice was poured out on Christ for me, I received mercy. God gave me what I did not deserve. That's grace. God did not give me what I did deserve. That's mercy. Had Paul received what he should have gotten, what he would, would he have gotten? He would have gotten punishment. He would have gotten death. I love what Augustine says. He says, God does not choose a person who is worthy, but by the act of choosing him, makes him worthy. God did not show salvation to you and me because we were worthy of salvation. No, God has shown his grace. Grace has overflowed. It's abounded to us. He's withheld uh, judgment from us. We've received mercy and we are now worthy of what God has given to us. God does not call the qualified, you know. God qualifies the called. Amen. God has shown mercy to us. Paul could not get over mercy. Here in this passage, he mentioned it twice that God had shown him mercy. The psalmist says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's not just one time that I'm glad the Lord showed me mercy. I'm glad that mercy follows me. I'm glad on a daily basis that I do not get what I the psalmist would say in Psalm 119, Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Psalm 145, verse 9. Isaiah says this in, verse 30, in chapter 30. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. Do you, do you realize that our God... Isaiah says that our God waits to show you mercy. He waits to pour his grace out upon you. Our God is not a God with his arms folded on his chest waiting to give you what you deserve. Now, God, if you will, is sitting on the edge of his seat. He's standing on the edge of the platform 
waiting to show you grace, waiting to show you mercy, wanting his kindness to be shown to you. We also read in Ephesians that God, Barbara read that, that he's rich in mercy. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4, uh, let, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive what? Mercy in the time of need. Blessed be the God and Father, Peter says, of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. None of us would be here if it were not for the mercy of the Lord. If God had not chosen to withhold from us the very thing that we deserved, punishment, judgment, death, and all. Not only has he withheld us from us what we do deserve, he has given to us what we don't deserve. He has given grace to us. And Paul writes to Timothy to say, before we talk about all the things that you are going to do for the church, let me remind you of what God has done for you. Let me remind you of what God has done for the church. God has given mercy. But not only has God given mercy, God has given the gospel. He's given the gospel to us. Look at verse 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Here it comes. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. This is the message of Christianity. What God has done for us by sending Jesus into the world to die for us and to make us right with himself. Paul is telling Timothy, you be about this message. You proclaim this message. Don't let anybody in the church proclaim a different message. It's hard these days to know what you can trust and what you can't trust, isn't it? It's hard to know what is right and what is wrong. I heard somebody the other day, they said, you know, I read on the internet. I was like, well, that's not saying much. It's hard for us to discern between what is right and what is wrong, between what is good and what is bad, between uh, what is trustworthy and what is not trustworthy. But Paul says to Timothy in verse 15 of 1 Timothy 1, this is a trustworthy saying. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. You can take this to the bank. If you don't hear anything else that Paul says today in 1 Timothy, hear that Christ came into the world to save sinners. Christ came in the world to show mercy to you. He came in the world to show mercy to me. Paul would say that this is a trustworthy saying. He would say in chapter 3, look at chapter 3, verse 1. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone wants to be a, an overseer or a pastor, it's a noble calling. Chapter 4 and verse 9, he's going to say it again. He's going to say, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance. What? Godliness is valuable. Paul shot straight with Timothy. Paul didn't beat around the bush with Timothy. He said, here's what's trustworthy and here's what's not. But notice again in verse 15. Let's read it again. Who did Jesus come to say? The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save who? Sinners. Of whom I am the foremost. Paul would say, get all of the sinners in line, and that's what the scriptures teach. The scriptures teach that we are sinners and we are at the same time saints. Single Eustace S. Peccator. We're, the, we're justified and we're sinners. But Paul would say, get all of the sinners in line, and I'm at the front of the line. I am foremost. The NIV says, I'm the worst. Maybe you're reading the NIV. I'm the worst, it's translated. 
The King James says, I'm the chief of sinners. You realize how Paul was living his life before he came to know Christ? He was public sinner number one. And why did Jesus save sinners? Well, look at verse 16. But I received mercy for this reason. He's going to answer this question. That in me, as the foremost, he's there, he's going to say it again. Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Now, I benefit from salvation. When, when Jesus saves me, I receive mercy. I receive grace. Right? I receive forgiveness. I receive right standing before God. I receive abundant life. I receive eternal life. But Paul says... That Jesus saved him in order that he might show his patience. Paul said, listen, my salvation is not about me. My salvation is about Jesus. And Jesus saved me so that he might show his patience. So if you want to see the patience of Jesus, look at me. Now some of you men... You're still living in the glory days of your junior high and high school years. You know what I'm talking about. You still have some trophies. Your wife has wanted to like sell them at a yard sale, and you're like, no, 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 hold on to those a little bit longer. Let it go. Let it go. So, so sometimes what men will do is they'll take the trophies and put them all together, like in a trophy case, right? And, 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 and supposedly when you look at those trophy case, when you look at that trophy case, you see all of the trophies. And, and, and those are, they're evidences of accomplishments, right? I've never seen anybody go up to a trophy case and look at the trophy case. The purpose of the trophy case is to highlight the trophies that are in it. Right? I mean, we don't sit around going, well, look at that trophy case. Look at the way that trophy case is made. Look at how many shells are on that in that trophy case. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is, I am a trophy case of Jesus' patience. I, myself, I am a trophy of Jesus' patience. You want to see who Jesus is? You look at me. You want to see who God is? You look at me. You want to see the mercy of Christ? Look at me. Not because I'm all that. I'm just the case. And I'm holding the trophy, if you will, the trophy of Jesus' patience. God has given us this gospel. We are not like orphans who don't know our parents. We are not like those who wonder, how can we be saved? What does it mean to be right with God? No, God has told us exactly how we can be right with God. He has been gracious to give us his word. That's why I believe Paul in verse 17, after he talks about everything that God has done in his life, then he says this crazy phrase, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you know what Paul's doing? Paul, he just erupts in praise. Paul says, man, God has done all of this in my life. Not praise be to me. Praise be to him. Immortal, invisible God, only wise. Praise be to him. God's given us mercy. God's given us the gospel. But also, look at verse 18. God has given us a charge. He's given the church. We're talking about being the church. God has given us a charge. Verse 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom, and he's going to call names, are Hymenaeus and Alexander. 
whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now this word charge, it can be translated instruction or command. Paul is not just giving Timothy a suggestion. He's not just giving him a helpful hint on what he should do. He is giving him a charge. He's saying, this is your instruction. These are your marching orders. This is the marching order of the church. He says in verse 3, we find that word charge. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any doc different, different doctrine. Verse 5, the aim of our charge, the reason that I'm doing this, is coming from a pure heart and a good conscience. Let's give over to chapter 5. He's going to use the word again in verse 21. He says, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudice, doing nothing for partiality. Chapter 6 and verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Paul was a plain spoken man. And he charged Timothy to charge the church with their charge. You get the point? Paul is saying, this is what you're to do. Paul charged him to proclaim the truth. He charged Timothy and the church to stick to the truth, to not swerve from the truth, to love the truth, to hold fast to the truth, to minister according to the truth, to lead the church according to the truth. Paul knew what Jesus said in John 8, 32, that if you know the truth, the truth will set you up free. <laughs> truth does not bind us. Truth does not shackle us. Truth frees us up. Paul is going to end this chapter by calling out the names of two men. I believe there was probably pain in Paul's heart when he talked about these men, Hymenaeus and Alexander. I've got a friend who seemed to be walking the ways of the Lord, and he shipwrecked his life. He's not walking according to the truth anymore. We have a mutual friend. And I heard this friend, the mutual friend, talking to a group. He was leading a conference, and he was talking about our friend. You know what he did? <clears throat> he wept. Because he knew that our friend had swerved from the truth. He had left the truth. He had walked away from the truth. What do we see? Come thou fount of every blessing. We're prone to wonder. I need you to hold me to this. We need each other to hold us to this. This past weekend, I, this past week, I went to East Tennessee. About 45 minutes to the other side of Knox, Terry, what you would say is the promised land. <laughs> If you go east on I-40, and we've all done it, you're going to cross the Tennessee River. If you go far enough. And when you're driving, there are these big concrete walls on each side. On this side, and on this side. And I, I, you know, I, I might feel, I might feel more free if I could see more. I mean, I, you know, I'm driving, up, I gotta quickly look over there at the water. Quick. I, I might feel as though I might have less inhibitions if those rails weren't, weren't there. But y'all, those rails are good. I need those rails. As long as I drive, 
hopefully it's not like this, hopefully it's straight. But as long as I drive in between those rails, I'm good. And if I do not drive in accordance with the guidelines, the rails that are there, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go off into the river. And that's what Hymenaeus and Alexander did. It's like they were driving to East Tennessee and they started crossing the Tennessee River and they said, guardrails, who needs them? And Paul says they shipwrecked, different metaphor. Paul says they shipwrecked their lives. Freedom is found when we live in accordance with God's guidelines. Freedom is not found when I do what I feel like I should do. Freedom is found when I live according to the Spirit, according to God's law. And this is the message. This is the instruction. This is the command that God has given to us, the church, to share with the world. The fact of the matter is, this message is not always palatable. To all. We live in a world where people want to do their own thing. We live in a world where if it feels good, people want to do it. But that's not the message of the Bible. It may feel good now, but like Hymenaeus and Alexander, it will be the shipwrecking of their lives. We as the church, we have the greatest news in the world that we can share with those out there. We have a charge, and the charge is to communicate what has been given to us. Mercy has been given to us. <laughs> Let's show it to others. The gospel has been given to us. Let's not hoard it. Let's not hold on to the gospel ourselves. Let's not keep it right here. No, let's tell other people the gospel. God has given us a charge, and that charge is to be the church and to do what the church is supposed to do. That is, tell other people. God has given us these things, not so that we might hoard God's blessings, God has given us these things so that we might be the church. And that by being the church, the world will hear the good news of the gospel. Amen? Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I said let's be the church. Let's be who God's called us to be. Let's be merciful to each other. Let's show mercy to others. Let's be about the gospel. Let's share the gospel. This is our charge. This is what God has given to us. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we have received so much. What do we have that we have not received from you? Like Saul, you have shown mercy to us. You have withheld what we should have received. You have given us grace. You have given us that which we did not deserve. And Lord, we know the gospel. We know it's a trustworthy saying. We, we stand on these promises as we've sung this morning. We, we live according to the gospel, the truth that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners us, that's me, that's all of us. You've given us the charge to not only proclaim this truth, you've given us the charge to live according to the truth. Father, we pray that whatever we do for others would be a, a direct outflow of what you have done for us. 
You are a great God. Immortal, invisible, you are the only wise God. And on this cold day, where we're anticipating it being even colder and snow falling, Lord, we are thankful for the warmth in our hearts, the grace that you have shown us in the gospel fact that we are right with you, that you are our God, that you are our Father. Thank you, O oh God, for making us the church. Thank you for the privilege of being the church. Come what may, we pray that indeed we might be faithful. Pray this in Jesus Christ's name. All of God's people said. I'm going to ask you.